Greetings, dear viewer, and welcome back. In the last part, we took our first look at what geocentrism can contribute to the space age by seeing what happens when it tries to put things into Earth orbit. It didn't go well. In this part, we'll look at what happens when geocentrists try to explore a rotating universe from a fixed Earth. First, we need to understand something of geocentric space, which is an inconsistent affair constructed from a mishmash of attempts to explain isolated phenomena, whilst not really explaining any of them. We need to understand something of geocentric space, because geocentrists don't. Some geocentrists will claim that objects beyond Neptune don't travel faster than light, because they're moving with space, and it's space itself that's moving faster than light at that distance. Here then, geocentrists think of objects attached to a rotating coordinate system, or of a viscous space that carries things along for the ride. In part 4, we saw a bunkum explanation where geostationary satellites are claimed to be moving against the flow of space rotating around Earth, in order to appear motionless. An ill-conceived analogy to explain this is that of a boat motoring against the flow of a river, so that it stays in the same position relative to the shore. As it happens, whilst geocentrists might think this is helpful in explaining their horse shit, it is a fine example of why there is no beginning to their ability to actually think things through. The boat analogy requires one to forget that a boat motoring up a river needs to apply a constant force against the flow in order to do so. Luckily, geocentrists have another excuse up their sleeve. No thrust is needed to keep moving against space because it is frictionless. Here then, geocentrists want to invoke different kinds of space whenever it is convenient to do so. The obvious downside of the reality of space being essentially empty is that it has no viscosity, and therefore no friction. It makes no difference whatsoever whether it is rotating around Earth, around Jupiter, moving in a straight line, doing a highland jig, or sitting motionless. The idea that objects move with or against the flow of an arbitrary coordinate system is void. However, for the purposes of this video, we'll consider these two kinds of space rotating around Earth. The first job for any space program, of course, is to get into space. Otherwise, you haven't got a space program. How does this work in a geocentric universe? Everything in the sky supposedly rotates from east to west. With viscous space, it makes sense that the geocentrist rocket should not be launched against the flow, but rather with it. The geocentrist can use less fuel getting into space that way, and they can do this by either heading straight up, or preferably by heading west. With a static Earth and frictionless space, a geocentrist can launch rockets from anywhere and in any direction, with no difference in fuel consumption. The head-scratcher for geocentrists is why the world's space agencies launch expensive, heavy vehicles mostly to the east, from sites as close to the equator as possible. Do they really do this just to pretend that geocentrism is false? It's actually easier to launch to the east, and uses less fuel to achieve orbital speeds. We know an object must have a certain speed to move in a given orbit. Thus, the more speed you have to start with in the direction of your chosen orbit, the less you have to add by propulsion later. Since Earth rotates eastward, the closer your launch site is to the equator, the greater the speed boost you can get by launching in the same direction. Consider an observer watching a launch from a point above Earth as it rotates underneath him. A rocket sits on a launch pad at ESA's spaceport in French Guiana, 5.2 degrees north of the equator. It already has an eastward component to its velocity of over 1600 kilometers per hour before it lifts off. This advantage can be carried through the atmosphere and out into orbit. If you launch to the west, you first have to undo the advantage that Earth's rotation provides, and then build up speed for a westward orbit. This means more fuel, heavier rockets, and a more expensive space program. Vehicles destined for polar orbits are launched westward, in order to remove that eastward motion. Those destined for the inner solar system may also be accelerated in a westward direction, to give them a transfer orbit that'll take them towards the inner planets. Space programs work the way they do and don't waste fuel due to a fundamental property of reality, namely geocentrism being bollocks. Assuming they got into space, can geocentrists explore the solar system with probes or manned spacecraft? 
With Visca, space rocket science for the geocentrist is easy. They can simply point a spacecraft at its destination and let it travel a straight line through rotating space. Of course, there is a slight problem with this idea. If space is in any way viscous so as to carry objects like planets along for the ride, a rocket heading out into the solar system has to move against the flow of space that is induced against it by its own speed. And of course, there's never just one problem. Geocentrist rocket scientists need to consider the crazier planetary spirals, in which the planets move up and down and round and round to produce the seasonal and distance variations that we observe from Earth. A geocentrist sending a probe to Mars must, like his heliocentrist counterpart, take account of where the planet will be in future. Here the similarity ends. Geocentrists have no mathematics to describe or predict the motion of anything, so they're a bit stuffed. Perhaps frictionless space can help. With frictionless space there is a linear relationship between an object's distance from Earth and the speed it needs to move at to circle Earth once a day, notwithstanding variations due to craps, of course. How exactly do you put a craft in orbit around, say, Mars, when it would need to be barreling along at anywhere between 3,979 km per second and 7,446 km per second, depending on its distance to circle Earth once a day? There is only one force that can be exploited to put a craft in orbit around a planet. Sadly, it's not Mr. Space Hammerman this time either. It's that most familiar contender. Gravity, you fucking retard! Given the speeds of planets in their universe, the geocentrist rocket scientist has his margins for error reduced drastically. Arrives slightly ahead of time and his craft could simply be smashed by a speeding planet. Arrive at Mars just 10 seconds too late and the planet is nowhere near his craft anymore. Just a couple of seconds too late and you're still thousands of kilometers out and have zero hope of a correct orbital insertion. This is even more of a problem if we allow for the claim that gravity may mysteriously drop to zero at ranges short enough to explain geostationary satellites. Sticking with real gravity, if the craft arrived exactly where you expected it to in relation to the planet, it still stands no chance of getting into orbit around it. Although it didn't pass Mars itself, the fastest vehicle launched away from the Sun, the New Horizons probe headed for Pluto in 2018, passed Mars orbit at a speed of around 21 km per second. With gravity assist, the Voyager craft were able to hit the 30s after their encounter with Saturn. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter was sent to the Red Planet with a fuel tank containing 1,187 kg of hydrazine. Over 70% of that fuel was used in one maneuver, a 27-minute long rocket burn for orbital insertion. This put it into an elliptical orbit with a periapsis 400 km above the surface and an apoapsis of 44,500 km. MRO then spent six months using Mars' atmosphere to gradually shape its orbit into its near-circular one, ranging from 255 to 320 km above the Martian surface. This long aerobraking phase meant the amount of fuel needed on the craft was almost halved. How fast does MRO travel around its orbit? We can get a fair estimate for this since its orbit is nearly circular and the mass of MRO is insignificant compared to that of Mars. We'll use this formula. The average speed is the root of gm over a. g is the now familiar universal gravitational constant, m is the mass of Mars, and a is the semi-major axis of the orbit, for which we'll use the equatorial radius of Mars plus the altitude of MRO's orbit at around 300 km. Crunch the numbers and MRO's orbital speed is 3.4 km per second. If Mars is flying through space at over 4,000 km per second, you can't get into orbit around it, no matter what angle you approach it from. Naturally, this problem gets worse with more distant objects in the solar system. As well as contending with the speeds of objects increasing with distance from Earth, our geocentrist rocket scientist faces another problem. There are countless other objects out there whizzing round his static Earth once a day. Sending a craft out through this maelstrom of rock, metal and ice significantly increases the chances of something colliding with his spacecraft. It will cross the paths of many objects every single day. 
whilst real spacecraft do run the risk of collision with undetected objects whilst travelling out into the solar system, the chances are fleeting. The speeds we can achieve, and all the problems that the geocentric universe introduces, and the lack of any relevant physics presented by geocentrists, goes a long way to explaining why geocentrism has contributed nothing to the space age. Whilst geocentrists might like to claim that their universe is true, of course it isn't. And that's why real rocket science has run the gamut from providing the most accurate landing yet seen, to providing invaluable insights to the workings of the universe, to accidentally drawing a gentleman's sausage on Mars. The irony is that we've been able to do all these things and draw bollocks on the red planet, in no small part because geocentrism is bollocks. Geocentrists do have an opportunity to redeem themselves though, and demonstrate their model once and for all on a worldwide stage. At the time of writing, 23 teams are competing for the Google Lunar X Prize, a $30 million prize for landing a robot on the moon, travelling more than 500 metres, and sending back high-definition video, before the end of 2015. If geocentrism is true, then someone needs to supply these teams with the alternative physics that they'll be needing to make sure their efforts aren't in vain. They need to know that in the geocentrist's universe, the Moon is circling Earth at over 25 kilometers per second, rather than the 1 kilometer per second that established physics would have them believe. Of course, geocentrists have no physics, or none that they've been willing to share with the world so far. Something to do with the spirit of open education, or something like that. In which case, rather than sharing their knowledge with an existing team, perhaps they would like to enter a team of their own and demonstrate the validity of their model by landing a craft on the moon. Some geocentrists excuse themselves from having to explain space exploration, let alone take part in it, by invoking conspiracy theories, so this would be the perfect opportunity for them to prove that their claims of a science conspiracy are also true. Not content with a global conspiracy of science to hide the stationary Earth from everyone, the rational world has also constructed an entirely fake space program just to piss on the chips of people who know the truth. Tens of thousands of people learn incorrect physics at school, work hard to get a relevant degree using false physics, get their dream job, and then have to waste their days being paid to generate fake imagery and data from fake spacecraft that exist in parking lots and sound stages. These people are so content and utterly unresentful of having wasted their academic lives that they are only too happy to spend all day creating fake material, lauding fake achievements of humanity's fake ingenuity in response to a fake understanding of a universe in which we live. Not one of them ever leaves such a soul-destroying sham of a job, and none of them ever get pissed off that their education was a waste of time when they learn the secret truth behind the world's space agencies. Conspiracies are another subject for another time on this channel, but for now, suffice to say that you've got to be a special kind of moron to think the world operates that way. Or to believe in the total bollocks that is geocentrism. The reality of getting spacecraft between planets or other objects in the solar system is far more interesting than the answerless excuses that geocentrism needs to cling to. Next up in part 6 though, we'll look at even more reasons why the number of legs geocentrism has to stand on is zero, to any number of significant figures one cares to choose. See you then.